Well, good morning, and welcome to our service this morning. The service is a little bit different and significant and special for us as a congregation. Uh, today, towards the end of the service, uh, we'll be administering a baptism to Joel. Uh, she's going to be professing her faith in the Lord Jesus and being baptized here this morning in our congregation uh, and at the, towards the end of the service, although throughout the service there will be a, a theme and a thinking towards baptism as we read God's Word and we'd have somebody else who was baptized uh, as well as they came to faith. Uh, the young folk will go out to Sunday school after we uh, pray the Lord's Prayer together in just a little while. And just to note that this is the last Sunday school Uh, before the holidays, the October holidays. Uh, I was away preaching elsewhere last weekend, so wasn't able to uh, be in the pulpit to announce and share with you. Uh, Some of you may know already, but uh, Ailey, my wife, and I are expecting a baby in in April uh, the 1st, so thank you for those who have been in touch already. But we give thanks to God for that. And we come today to worship God. So let's do that. Let's sing together in Psalm 34, in the Sing Psalms, Psalm 34, we'll sing from verse 1 down to verse 9. It's on page 40 of the Blue Book. At all times I will bless the Lord, I'll praise Him with my voice, because I glory in the Lord, let troubled souls rejoice. Psalm 34, if you're able, we'll stand and sing to God's praise.
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are in your house this morning. We thank you that we are able to come and worship you, give you glory to reset our perspective if it needs to be, that we would gaze our attention and our focus on you, our God, alone. And we come having sung these words of that psalm, and the psalm, these words where we're singing, Come, taste and see that the Lord is good. And that is our prayer as we come Sunday by Sunday, and as we live out our lives day by day, that you would be working in the lives of our family members and our friends and those who are here, that they would taste and see the goodness of our God, that their eyes would be opened to see and to believe. And as we come to this special service today, where we rejoice as a congregation, where you have opened the eyes of another one of your people to see and to believe. Lord, may we be encouraged and may we give you all of the thanks and all of the glory. We thank you for our young people who are here and as they are taught through in the Sunday school, here in the services and even in their own homes. Lord, we pray for that seed of the gospel uh, to take root and that we would continue to shower that seed with our prayers, bringing them and all of your people, those in this community and the congregation, Lord, that we will be praying for them. For we are a family of believers as we gather here today. We thank you for those who have joined with us uh, today, who have come into this service. We, Lord, we pray that they would feel welcome and that they would feel a part of the service and that you would speak tenderly and directly uh, to them as well. Lord, as we go through our service today, help us. Help us to keep our eyes on Christ alone, that you would take us through it and teach us and show us and reveal more of yourself to us. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm just going to speak with the young folk, so uh, it would be great if I could have your attention just for a few moments, and after we have the children's talk and we'll pray together, the young ones will go out for Sunday school, and just for your notes, they'll come back in uh, to be able to witness and see the baptism taking place uh, later on. But I want to ask the young ones especially, have you done anything wrong? Have you ever done anything wrong? I was all the way down in a place called Campbelltown last week, and I asked them this question. I wonder if you think they've ever done anything wrong all the way down there, these kids. I asked it in Hilton this morning, and they said, yeah, we've done some things wrong. So I wonder if the Tain kids ever do anything wrong. You know, it might be that you break some rules, or that you've told a little lie to your, to your parents or your siblings, from time to time, maybe we have all done something wrong. I think we all have. We call these sins. That's what we read off in the Bible. The wrong things we do are called sins. And so I want to try and uh, uh, paint a little picture for you. Because last week, I went out on Thursday morning into the garden. I went to put the car on before going out early in the morning And as I went out into the garden, all I could see was rubbish everywhere. There was some milk bottles up against the trees. There were some letters pressed up against the bushes. And perhaps some of my neighbors would have been able to see uh, some uh, of the sweets that I had been eating in the past week. Uh, I would have been busted as to how many uh, Kit Kat Chunkies I have eaten each evening. But I went uh, round the garden, having it been a really windy night, it had knocked over the bin, put rubbish everywhere. So 
I went round the garden and picked up every little bit of rubbish. The milk bottles and the letters and the Kit Kat chunky wrappers. And I put them all back into the bin. And then hours later, even minutes later, the bin lorry came, emptied the bin, and there wasn't a trace of rubbish to be found in the garden at all. See, all of these bad things that we do, the wrong things we do, we call them sins. So how many sins, this isn't really a nice question to think about, but how many wrong things, sins, do you think you've done this week? You should have heard the the Hilton answer, they had a lot. How many sins do you think we've done in our whole life? And in these nice white walls, what if I wrote all of your sins up on these walls? You know, I would find that really uncomfortable. It wouldn't be very nice to see it there. Everybody would be seeing them. would feel quite ashamed if we saw it. I'd want them all to be taken down. And you know, that's exactly what Jesus offers to do for you. He offers to take all of the sins down. He offers to wipe them all away because of what He has done for us on the cross. And you're going to see something really special later today when Joelle comes up. She's going to be baptized. I'm going to throw some water onto her. But that water being put onto Joelle is a picture of what has already happened in her life. That she has believed in Jesus to be her Savior. And she believes that Jesus has washed away all of the wrong things she has ever done and will do in her life. And that is amazing how God has saved her. And that offer to be saved and have all the rubbish of sin in your life washed away from you is available for you whether you're young here today or whether you're older. The offer for your sin to be washed away is given to you whether you believe or not. So let's pray together. We're going to pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Amen. Well, the young ones can make their way out at this point. We're going to uh, read God's Word from the New Testament, from the book of Acts, in chapter 8. It's on page 1101, if you have a pew Bible. So, Acts chapter 8, we're going to read from verse 26 down to the end of the chapter. Acts 8 and verse 26, let's hear the word of God. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home he was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. And then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. 
How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And the eunuch was reading this passage of Scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he did not open its mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? And then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they travelled along the roads, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptised? And he gave orders to stop the chariot, Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, and he went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Amen. This is... The Word of God. Well, let's just bow together in another word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, as we continue in our worship, having read your Word and been singing from it, and as we anticipate hearing it explained, we can think of this scene with Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch because the word was read to him and explained to him and the Holy Spirit opened his eyes and his heart to see and to believe. We notice that he was seeking, he was searching for the truth. And so our prayer is, Lord, for those who are here, who have come to your house just like that Ethiopian eunuch did, who may be seeking for themselves, searching for the truth of the gospel, that as we read it and explain it and it's preached in our hearing today, or we are in need of the power of the Holy Spirit to open these people's eyes and hearts so they may see and believe. And we rejoice today because we are able to witness that that has happened in our community, whether recently or even a few years ago. And yet today, publicly professing another one of your people, that they love you, that you've saved them, that you are their Saviour. When we pray, Lord, thanking you for this occasion, and that as a congregation, we are encouraged that the Lord is working in our midst, that despite many hindrances that we may see to the progression of the Gospel, that nothing can stop you from what you do and from you seeking and saving the lost. Lord, we want to pray for other congregations throughout our church, throughout the denomination. And we think of the congregation down in Kirkcaldy. We pray for Reverend John Johnson and his wife and family. That you would just continue to encourage them. We pray for the housing scheme that has been built And as the new families and individuals and couples may move into these homes, that you would enable uh, that church to uh, be a light amongst them and be able to give them the invitation, not merely to church services, but to Jesus Christ. And we pray with them uh, for an apprentice to join the congregation uh, by next summer. Uh, We we think of our own... uh, Uh, Ministry candidate David Ferguson, who's been working alongside us and continues to do so, 
And so we pray, Lord, that uh, someone in that same position would be provided uh, for Kirk Cody and that there would be a ministry team and partnership formed uh, for John, uh, the minister. Lord, we just pray for them and uh, we want to do that publicly and corporately together, but just bringing them in our prayers privately as well. Heavenly Father, may you continue with us. Be with each one who has gathered here today. In their different situations and circumstances, you know all that's going on in each of our hearts. And so we pray uh, that you would draw near and meet us all at the point of our needs. And that your word today would open the eyes of the blind. That it would encourage those who need that encouragement. And Lord, we pray that you would just continue with us as your people in this community. Forgive us, Lord, we know our sins are many, the wrong things that we have done. But how amazing is your grace that the walls of our heart have been washed clean through the blood of Jesus Christ. We pray all of this in your precious holy name. Amen. Well, let's uh, sing together before we turn to this passage, Psalm 103 in the Scottish Psalter. It's on page 369 of the Blue Books. We're going to sing from verse 8 to verse 12. The Lord our God is merciful and He is gracious, long-suffering, and slow to wrath, in mercy plenteous. Psalm 103 from verse 8 to 12. We'll stand and sing to God's praise. And the rain was lashing as usual and the, cra- the waves were crashing uh, against the side of uh, the Kalmak ferry. 
And then it arrived, the Coast Guard uh, search and rescue helicopter hovered overhead and winched one of its crew down onto the vessel to save the life of the injured passenger. And as I sat there in the observation lounge and witnessed all of this with the other passengers going on, we were relieved to discover that this was a practice. This was an exercise in anticipation of the real event. Now, we wouldn't want to find ourselves in a situation like that when we would be in need of the emergency services coming out to save us, and yet we are so thankful that there is such services who would risk their lives for ours. We read in Acts chapter 8, and it may not seem like this is a state of emergency. After all, we've read about an African man who went to church and who's reading his Bible on the way home. And yet, what is happening in this chapter is an emergency. This Ethiopian eunuch is lost. He's in grave danger. He is bound for destruction. Just like every single person who has not put their trust in Jesus Christ alone. This is not a drill. This eunuch is seeking, God is saving, which leaves the man singing. So let's uh, look at each of these as we make our way through and journey down the south road, seeking, saving, and singing. Well, first of all, he was seeking. Uh, In that picture we imagined and described of the rescue helicopter coming out onto the sea and winching down a man to rescue somebody to safety. It is the emergency services in that situation who do the searching. They search for the person who they're going to save. But in one way, as we think about somebody becoming a Christian, It's the person who's in danger. It's the person who is lost who has to do the searching and who does the seeking in order to be saved by God. Uh, We don't have the name of this Ethiopian eunuch. All we know is where he was from and what he did. Uh, Kings and queens used to appoint eunuchs over uh, their important affairs. So we discover that this man was very Powerful. He would have had a lot of responsibility. We learn that he's the chief treasurer of a wealthy kingdom. But we know that this eunuch was traveling back to Africa from Jerusalem after attending a religious festival. And we don't know exactly what he believed at this point. Perhaps he had converted to Judaism at least, having heard about God in his home country, or even as he came to Jerusalem. But what does seem clear is that he doesn't have a full grasp. He isn't clear about who Jesus is. Doesn't isn't able to articulate or understand how Jesus fits into the story. And so if you look in your Bibles there to verse 28, On his way home, he was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. He was reading part of the Bible. There was surely a work going on in this man's life. As I just said, we don't know exactly what he believed or what he understood at this point, but uh, but clearly he he was hungry to know more than he did know. He had a desire to leave home and journey all the way up to Jerusalem to be at these worship services, to be at church. He wanted to dig into the Word of God 
so that he could know and discover the God of the Word. So just take note of these simple things that the eunuch was doing. He had been to worship and now he was reading the Word. We don't only open our Bibles to read it on Sundays, do we? But we're as Christians to read God's Word day by day. It's our daily bread. And so are we reading our Bibles? The Word of God is so freely available to us. Now we can obviously read it and pick it up in a book. We have it on our phones or our devices. We can listen to it being read by anybody really. And we can have it read in whatever accent or language we like. And yet, are we reading the Bible? Are we listening to what God is saying? It's perhaps available to us in more ways than ever before, and yet are we reading it less than before? The true Christian's desire is to be in the worship of God and to be in the Word of God. Do you have that hunger and appetite to be at the services? Do you have that hunger and appetite to be reading your Bible? Do you have that hunger and appetite to be at the worship of God and to be in the Word of God? Now we know that attending church or even reading our Bibles every day does not in and of itself mean that we have become Christians. But it is a good indication that if someone wants to be in church, wants to be under the preaching of the gospel, and if that person unprompted wants to open and read their Bible, then I think we could safely conclude that there is at least a stirring going on in that person's life. That they are exploring the truths of Scripture. That they are looking for the truth about Jesus, and they're seeking to find it out for themselves. They're searching and they're seeking for the truth. And it can be encouraging if you notice a family member or friend or even somebody coming here to the services and you can observe that they are seeking for themselves. That they are exploring Christianity. I have no doubt that there is some in here who are doing that. They're seeking and searching for the truth of the gospel. And that seeking, that process that may be very fresh and new, may have been in recent days or weeks. For some it may have gone on a lot longer than that. But one thing and one warning perhaps, if that is you today, Don't stop short of finding Jesus. Don't only go halfway, but come all the way into Jesus and listen to Jesus who says, Ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. So the invitation is to come, to come all the way to Jesus. Search for him and don't stop searching until you find him. So we see and we notice that this Ethiopian eunuch was seeking, but then secondly, God was saving So as he asks for the door to be opened, we notice that it is the Lord who opens the door. The door was opened for this seeking soul. And this is where Philip comes in. Philip was set aside to work alongside the other apostles. He was an evangelist. And he was already enjoying a very fruitful ministry in uh, the city of Samaria. You can read in your Bibles there in verses 4 to eight of how successful that ministry was, the crowds that were being saved in the city, 
through Philip's ministry. But now he's led out of the city. Now Philip, through the Holy Spirit, is guided out of the city streets and onto the rural countryside. And he hasn't even been brought out into the country in order to preach to whole villages. He's led by the Holy Spirit out to read the Bible with one man. And that's a great responsibility and privilege that as preachers, but as Christians, we all have. Not that we need to go and preach to thousands, but we all have the ability to come and read and share the gospel with one other person, to tell them about Jesus, to share how Jesus has worked in your heart and to show them from the Bible who Jesus is. You read there in verse 30, Philip asks the Ethiopian, do you understand what you're reading? He says, how can I, unless someone explains it to me? So not only has this Ethiopian got the word of God in his hands, but now God has sent a teacher alongside him to explain it. And what a journey, as I was thinking about this throughout the week. What a journey it must have been down that south road as Philip climbs up onto the chariot and the two of them are sitting there journeying down the road. The scroll is unfolded, it's across their laps and Philip is then taking him line by line or section by section and explaining the truths of the gospel uh, to this man. And he opens that scroll to Isaiah 53. And for many of you, you know, wow, of all the passages in the Old Testament that this African man could have been reading, and yet he was studying one of the clearest pointers and pictures to the Messiah. And so Isaiah, in that chapter, he speaks about this lamb as we read there from verse 32 and 33. Isaiah speaks about the lamb that did not open its mouth, the lamb that was being led to the slaughter, the lamb who was given no justice, the lamb whose life was taken away. The book of Isaiah, it tells us that we can be saved through this suffering servant, that he offered himself as a sacrifice for our sins, that he would be punished by God and go down to hell in order to raise us to heaven. And so the eunuch asks a very important question, a question that if you are seeking and searching for Jesus, you must ask today too. And listen to the answer. When the Ethiopian asks the question in verse 34, having heard all about this suffering servant, having heard all about this lamb that was being led to the slaughter, He asks, who is the prophet Isaiah talking about? Himself or somebody else? Because if this suffering servant, if this lamb to the slaughter is just some Isaiah talking about himself, or if he's talking about some other figure from history, then it changes nothing. But if he's talking about the Messiah, if he's talking all about Jesus, then it changes everything. The perfect Son of God. Now we're at the moment uh, running a course called Christianity Explored. And much like this scene between the Ethiopian and Philip, we study uh, one book of the Bible and we seek to find out the answers to these three Crucial questions. Who is Jesus? Why did Jesus come? And what does Jesus want from me? And so in a very similar way, that is the route Philip would have taken this man on. He would have explained who Jesus was. That he was the Son of God. He would have explained why Jesus came to save sinners for all our sins to be washed away. And it would have explained what Jesus wants from you seeking 
searching for him. He doesn't just want your church attendance and Bible reading. He wants your life and your soul and your all. He wants you to ask him into your heart. And he will come in and take away all of your sins. You know, the Lord works in mysterious ways. Before Jesus returned to heaven, He told His disciples, when the Holy Spirit comes, go out with the Gospel from Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And this African man is proof of the advancement of of the Gospel, that it was spreading far and it was spreading wide, that various people at a- different ages and stages were coming to believe in Jesus. Just read through, especially the early chapters of Acts, and you will read of how many were being added to their number to the church of Jesus Christ. And as a congregation here in Tainer Fern, we must be greatly encouraged today. And if we cannot be encouraged and rejoice in days like today, then when will we be? We should be encouraged because despite all the odds, the gospel is advancing in your community, in your town and villages. At the communion two weeks ago, and once again today, we are witnessing teenagers publicly profess their faith and love for Jesus Christ. In the midst of darkness, and by that I mean you know yourself throughout the world, spiritually dark place. In the midst of darkness, both of them who are part of an education system that is more and more seeking to suppress the truth and the light of the gospel, they have been saved. The gospel witness in our school, in our academy, has at least doubled in recent days and weeks. Other members, even part of your congregation here, a part of that school. The Holy Spirit is orchestrating all of this because the spread of the gospel cannot be stopped. So surely you are encouraged and are rejoicing as members of Christ's church here in this community witnessing souls being saved. Be thankful for these lives that have been saved and be encouraged that many more can be saved as well. So we see that the Ethiopian eunuch was seeking God, was saving him, and he goes away singing. Thirdly, he's singing. As the eunuch heard about Jesus, uh, it all just fell into place for him. He believed instantly and put his trust in Christ. You know, many people who are seeking, who are searching for the truth, for for the gospel, they delay professing their faith. They delay because they're waiting for some dramatic experience. And perhaps they delay because they're waiting for some fuzzy feeling to happen inside. They delay perhaps because They're waiting for this light to shine out of heaven like we read happened to Saul of Tarsus. But look what happened with this Ethiopian eunuch. He heard the gospel and he believed in the gospel. You need to stop waiting for what you have already received. The light of the gospel has already come and is shining here today through God's Word and as as it is preached, the light of the world has come through Jesus Christ. And as you hear the Word of God, 
May you respond to it today in faith and in trust and in simple belief in Christ alone. Have a look at verse 36. Then this man asks to be uh, baptized, which proves his belief. He wanted to not only trust inwardly about God, but testify publicly that he was a Christian. And there were many reasons to hinder him from doing this. He could lose his job. He could become an enemy to his queen. His country could loathe him. But he considered that a price worth paying compared to the price that Jesus has already paid for him and for all who believe. Now, as we're about to see, baptism is a symbol of an individual becoming part of Christ's church. And yet, much more than that. It's also a powerful sign to the community of Tain and Fern and to this congregation that God's grace has been poured out, that a relationship with Christ exists with the believer and the sins of the believer have been washed away. We sang in Psalm 103, as far as east is from the west, so far has God removed our sins from us. And after he was baptized, in verse 39, he went on his way rejoicing and undoubtedly singing. Because baptism is not only about a day. Baptism is not only about a service. It's not only about a moment. We baptize our infants in hope and we baptize believers with the expectation that they will go on from here walking through life with the Lord Jesus at every step. To be baptized, it doesn't save you. But it says to your community and to your congregation, I will follow Jesus. Even as this Ethiopian goes away rejoicing and singing, it doesn't mean that he nor any Christian has an easy life from here on in. Just ask us. The eunuch didn't walk around with a permanent smile on his face and nothing bothering him ever again. There have undoubtedly been many challenges for him, difficulties, stumbling blocks to his faith. But his life was never the same again because he has discovered a joy that has become his strength. The joy of the Lord is his strength. And the Christian's happiness is not dependent on their circumstances. Instead we know that whatever comes into our life, There are many challenges. Nothing can alter the fact that you are forgiven from all of your sin. That you are set free from Satan's control. And that as there is a time to be born, there is a time to die. And that you, Christian, who have been saved by God, will spend eternity in His glory. Are you seeking Jesus to come into your life? Are you desiring to be in God's house? Are your interests shifting from the things of this world to the things of God's Word? The fact that you're here, it may suggest that there is some element of searching or seeking going on in your life. But if that is you today, Do not stop short. Do not go halfway. But come all the way to Jesus. And as you search for Him, may He save you and rescue you today. Today there is opportunity. We read elsewhere in the New Testament, as long as it is called today, nothing prevents you from coming to Christ. Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. Let's pray.
O Lord our God, we uh, do thank you for your word. We thank you for how you brought Philip alongside this Ethiopian eunuch to explain the word of God to him. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, you opened that man's eyes and heart to see and believe. And that is our prayer for more in this congregation and in our community to see and believe through the power of the Spirit. May we rejoice today as a congregation that the gospel is advancing, that souls are being saved, and to whom much is given, much is required. We ask all of this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, we're going to sing in Psalm 127 in the Sing Psalms. We'll sing the whole psalm. It's on page 171. Unless the Lord builds up the house, its builders toil in vain. Unless he keeps the city safe, the vainly watch maintain. And verse 3. Sons are a precious heritage, a blessing from the Lord. The the children that are born to us are truly his reward. Psalm 127. We'll stand and sing to God's praise. now come to the part of the service uh, where we will baptise Joel in just a moment. Uh, I won't make her stand here for too long, so let me just say a, a couple of words before we, before we do so. Uh, 
We encountered the Ethiopian eunuch there who was seeking, who was saved and who sang. And he went away rejoicing. Now, the gospel spread from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And the African man was a testament to that. And Joel is testament to the continuation of that even today. You know, Joel was uh, privileged, like many have been, to grow up in Christian homes. Uh, she was taken to church. She was read the Bible. She was told about Jesus. But she had to seek and to search for Jesus herself. For mum and dad to know Jesus personally was not enough for her. And in a very similar way to this Ethiopian, Joel believed very simply from a young age in Jesus Christ as her Saviour. She asked and she received. She sought and she found. She knocked and the door was opened. Jesus says, let the little children come to me. And at a remarkably young age, the Lord opened her heart and saved her from her sins. As the eunuch asked, Joel asked in her own way, what is stopping me from being baptized? Well, today, Joel is publicly professing her faith and being baptized, symbolizing the transaction we believe that has already taken place in her heart, that her sins have been washed away. This is a precious and significant moment in Joelle's life. But she will go on from here, rejoicing. Very quickly, the water will dry The service will be over. But she will be united to Christ, both now and forevermore. Amen. Well, the congregation could please be upstanding, and if Joel could come forward. Just come up here and face towards the congregation. Well, having, um, let me read the warrant for uh, why we do baptism. We find that in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18 to 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, Joel, I have to ask you uh, three questions, so you can uh, answer them. First of all, do you acknowledge the Bible to be the Word of God and your only guide in all matters of faith and conduct? Do you confess God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as revealed in Scripture to be your God? Do you profess faith in Jesus Christ as the only Saviour of sinners and as your Saviour and Lord? Well, having taken these vows uh, before God, I can now proceed to baptise you. Without soaking you. Joel, Evie, McRae, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you and give you his peace. Let me give you this. (laughs) We'll just pray. Heavenly Father, we 
thank you and praise you for Joel, that you would be with her both now and forevermore. We thank you for her profession of faith and her love for Jesus. As she sought you, she found you. You saved her from her sins. And we pray that she would go away rejoicing. Go on with us. Encourage us as you have done today as a congregation. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can remain standing as we conclude by singing in Psalm 133. I will sing in the Sing Psalms version of this psalm. Psalm 133 is on page 175. How excellent a thing it is, how pleasant and how good, when brothers dwell in unity and live as brothers should. Mercy and peace from God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of you, both now and forevermore. Amen.